So today, as we continue on this path, we're going to talk about how was the Bible transmitted. And so the big question for you to consider as we go through this material is this question here. Is the Bible sitting in front of you the same as the original? That's the big question. Okay. So if it's special revelation that we have, special revelation that God has communicated to us in a collection, the massive collection is in this book, in this library. If this is legitimately the original, that's what we need to figure out. It's a big question. So we're going to talk about the transmission of Scripture. First of all, what is the Bible? We talked about it last week. It's a library of 66 books written over a 1,500-year period with around uh, close to 40 different authors, somewhere around 38. Uh, the Old Testament has 39 books. The Law comprised of Genesis through Deuteronomy. The historical books, uh, Joshua through Esther. The poetry books, Job, Song of Solomon. Uh, Job through Song of Solomon. The major prophets, Isaiah through uh, Daniel. And the minor prophets, uh, Hosea through Malachi. So there you have it. That's the Old Testament. The New Testament being four Gospels, one historical book, Acts, uh, 14 Pauline epistles, uh, that's letters that Paul wrote from Romans through Hebrews. And I, I realize as I say that I am in a minority of people who profess that Paul is the one who wrote Hebrews. And the reason I profess it is because we have the actual story of how Hebrews was written in church history that most people don't know about. Anyway. Uh, is that, is that in, uh, Eusebius? That's in Eusebius, yeah. Eusebius is quoting from uh, Clement. In fact, he says he's quoting from Clement, the disciple of Paul. And so who would know better than Clement, the disciple of Paul, about the situation of the writing of the book of Hebrews? All right. Seven general epistles, James through Jude, and of course, one prophetic apocalyptic work, Revelation. So it's a library of 66 books. So transmission, the original, actual, handwritten, or stone-chiseled writings are called the autographs. The autographs. Uh, we don't have any of the originals that we found. And honestly, I would not expect that we would have any of the originals. Because it is put on material that is combustible, that uh, it degrades over time. Uh, now, if we find the Ark of the Covenant, we would hope that we would find the stone tablets. So that would be pretty awesome to see that autograph. But the originals are called the autographs. The copies are called manuscripts. Manuscripts are when the scribe or prophet uh, takes the original here and then they're copying letter for letter, word for word uh, from the original and then they have a copy. And again, let me just say, we cannot use our modern standards of how you think you would do doing that sort of thing when actual professionals who do this for a living were the ones that were making these manuscripts, making these copies. Autographs are the originals. Manuscripts are the copies. We have tons and tons of manuscripts. Uh, such a great uh, collection of manuscripts. The, the fact that we have so many manuscripts helps us to know for certain what was in the original autographs. By a scientific measure, we can know what is in historical writings based on various historical writings, not just the Bible, we can know what the original autographs of the works, some of the works of Plato are, or Aristotle, Greek philosophers, or ancient historians. Because of the manuscripts evidence that we have for some of them, we can have a good idea of what the original was. In the case of the Bible, I've got a slide later that's going to show you. The Bible has the most manuscripts out of any ancient work that attest to what is in the original. There is nothing, scientifically, there is nothing that can compare to it 
the weight of evidence. How, how much is, has anybody ever done a study of variance percentage-wise? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. Uh -oh. Yeah, and we're headed there. Right. It's, a, it's textual criticism. We'll get there. Uh, Old Testament manuscripts, the way it was transmitted, the copyists were the prophetic community, fellow prophets, uh, priests, and scribes. These are the professional copyists. It was in Hebrew and Aramaic. Parts of Daniel are written in Aramaic. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, I forgot to list him among the authors. Nebuchadnezzar is one of the authors of the Bible. <laughs> and he, he writes in Daniel, and he writes in Aramaic. But otherwise, it's in Hebrew. And the New Testament manuscripts were, the copyists were the disciples of the apostles, the amanuenses, the scribes, and church leaders are the ones who did the copying for the New Testament. It was written in Koine Greek. Koine Greek is not the same as modern Greek. Koine Greek is a dead language. There's a lot of similarities with uh, modern Greek, certainly. Uh, but Koine Greek was the, Greek, the, the language that everybody spoke in the New Testament era thanks to our buddy, Alexander the Great. But I won't get started on Alexander. Uh, now it is worth noting this, you also get this from the early church records from Eusebius, Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, and the book of Hebrews were originally written in Hebrew. And then they were later translated into Greek. And uh, the early church fathers noted that. And I, I Unfortunately, there's some things I never learned at seminary. This is one of them. <laughs> uh, okay. All right. The transmission, the materials were stone, baked clay. They would... Oh, this is terrible lighting in here. Uh, you probably can't tell. They would... Uh, well, don't, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Um, <clears throat> but baked clay, so they would impress with a stylus. They would impress like cuneiform, if you've ever seen cuneiform, onto clay tablets. They would write the Hebrew, and then they would bake it, and it would preserve it, and then it could be used later to transfer onto a scroll. Uh, papyrus or animal skins that are sewn together that roll up to, to make a scroll. So they have sheets of what well, we could we take uh, individual sheets of paper that you might have like this except they're all going to be sewn together and then you can scroll them up like that. Uh, <clears throat> but the, the, cop the amazing thing and we're going to look at this too, the copies that we have are nearly identical to the most ancient, the copies, the later copies we have are almost identical to the ancient copies that we still have. Uh, and here's something important for you to note. As I told you, the Old Testament was written mainly in Hebrew. Well, there's two types of Hebrew. The earliest form of Hebrew is called Paleo Hebrew. It's the Hebrew that they wrote in before Israel or Judah went into exile. And it is this type of character, these type of characters right here. This is Paleo Hebrew right here. These type of characters, that's what it looked like. Which, this should not look familiar to you. That's not what we see today. Today we see Aramaic characters. This is the modern Hebrew. This, these characters are the Aramaic characters that they got from the Babylonian exile. And so when you're looking at copies of Scripture, let's just do a quick quiz, uh, a, a quick test in logic. If you're looking at copies of the Scripture, you have one scroll that has this writing, and we'll just say for the book of Genesis, and then one scroll that has this writing. Which one is earlier? The one that's Yeah, the Paleo-Hebrew one is, is going to be earlier. So that just gives you a little flavor of how, do you, how can you tell these things, where they came from and when they came from. Alright, so the Old Testament, the autographs were written between the 1400s BC and the 400s BC. That is from the time of Moses writing until the time of Malachi's writing. So we have a, a thousand year period where all the prophets are writing. And the oldest sample we have, oh man, maybe I should. Uh, the oldest sample that we have is this uh, KH2. All of these uh, actual manuscripts that we have have different names. This is KH2. There's also KH1. This comes from sometime during the reign of Hezekiah or Manasseh. It's uh, the Silver Scrolls. And it's 
either uh, KH1, which is not pictured here, but KH1 is either from Exodus 26 or Deuteronomy 5.10, just based on what they can put together for the words here. The script is Paleo-Hebrew, which is pretty cool. And so they've got KH1, KH2, uh, which in the Paleo-Hebrew, which is pretty phenomenal. Sorry, what is KH1? Uh, KH1... Okay, so it's, it's actually, I don't remember what the KH stands for. I've, I've, it's somebody's name. You, uh, typically, these things are named after the owner. Gotcha. And it, somebody, either uh, an archaeologist discovered it or somebody uh, got it from somewhere. Are they all housed together now? No. These are private spread. Collectors. There's private collections. The state of Israel's got lots of stuff. It's all over. Uh, Mark Lanier actually has some of the Dead Sea Scrolls, just a, a little portion of Esther. So this KH2 is from Numbers 6, 24 through 26. And somebody did a, a job of uh, recreating what it looks like with the Paleo-Hebrew. And uh, Hebrew is read from right to left. And then over here they put the modern Aramaic Hebrew. So trans the one on the left is an no, 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 no. I, this, is, this would not be an autograph because this is dated from the 700s to 600s. The book of Numbers would have been written in the 1400s by Moses. So it's a manuscript. Yeah, there are no autographs. All right, so there you have it. These are just examples. Uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, are, which Lael had mentioned a few weeks ago, were discovered in the Qumran, the caves of Qumran in the late uh, 1946 or early 1947 by a shepherd boy who threw a rock and it went into a cave and he heard a breaking jar. <laughs> Fascinating story. I've got a map on the next slide. There are so many copies, copies of the Old Testament in Paleo-Hebrew uh, portions, not like entire Old Testaments. And they've got Paleo-Hebrew, they've got Aramaic Hebrew, and they have Greek Hebrew. And an Essene community, which we're not going to get too much into the different communities in Israel, but during the time before Jesus and during Jesus' time and, and even afterward, the Essenes were, you could think of them kind of like John the Baptist, they had removed themselves from Jerusalem and they were living out in the wilderness, in the desert, waiting for the Messiah to come. They're like, uh, you could think of them like a monastic community who, who goes out and keeps all these copies of the Old and New Testament to themselves. These guys are out in the desert, and, they, and not just uh, copies of the Bible, but copies of their rules and copies of how their society is put together and, and what they have to do to, in order to stay there. Uh, but they had so many copies, and we discovered them in 1946, 1947. The copies themselves come mainly from the 3rd to 1st centuries B.C. and the 1st century A.D. So uh, for verifying what we have today, it's, it's so incredibly helpful. And the reason they stayed so well preserved is because of the dry climate in the area. Uh, things stay well, uh, are, are kept very well in the desert. So uh, even papyrus, paper. And it confirms, though, the, the copies that they have here confirm that what we have been copying over and over again from earlier manuscripts is almost exactly the same. We are going to go over some changes. Question? Um, how did... Because some of the scrolls, in, they had <coughs> pieces of this scene. Yes. So how were they to deciphering how what every word was like if I sent a letter and part of it was torn off could the person reading it be able to figure out deduction maybe, maybe not really yes okay so that's why uh, let's go back here okay that's why uh, KH1 is either Exodus 26 or Deuteronomy 510 or Deuteronomy 7 9 or Nehemiah 1 5 or Daniel 9 4 these are the options because of the words that they have. Like this is this is missing a lot. <laughs> and, and, and of course this is KH2, which they know is from Numbers 6, 24, and 26. 
but by, by analyzing the words that are used and the, and the parts of words and by looking at other later manuscripts to say, okay, how did, if, if we have a piece of this one, but then we have a full copy here that's from a different time period, we basically know what's being said. When there's a doubt, you say, eh, it's, it's one of these. <laughs> but there, if, if you had something in English but there are a lot of copies of it, and there's copies, full copies, then you'd probably have an easy time piecing together where it's at. Now the question would be, if one is older, then you wonder, well, is it exactly the same? But then they, they do use where it's at, like if there's a piece like this, they can do a good job if they have other pieces like this, of recreating the scroll itself to see where does it fit physically on the paper. And, and uh, there's actually a lot of Greek copies like that. Sorry. Oh, that's good. That's no, it wasn't. It was a great question. So it confirms the faithful transmission of the Old Testament copies that we have. And this is an amazing find because this is the earliest Hebrew that we have. Uh, here's the Qumran community. Here's the Dead Sea. Okay, these are the caves. Up here is the Sea of Galilee and the Jordan River. Mediterranean. Israel, okay, Jerusalem. So Dead Sea is not far away. So you can imagine these Essenes left the city and uh, under Roman rule left and came to live away because the good thing about the Essenes is they realized God was not blessing them in the land. They realized that the Pharisaical rulers were not pleasing in God's sight because they were suffering the curses of the law that we see in, in Deuteronomy 28. This is awesome. They have the entire book of Isaiah. And you can look at it yourself. The actual scroll, they have photo, photoed every single page. And they have an English translation of it. And when Dylan and I did teach through the book of Isaiah, we referred to the Dead Sea Scroll. And this copy, uh, you know, I didn't put it on there. Hmm? Where is it? At, at, at this link right here. Just come up here and click it. <laughs> well, <laughs> copy and paste it into your browser. Copy and paste this into your browser. And, you know, if I had given you the PowerPoint, you could just click it. Well, but what I mean, what is it um, physically? Oh, animal skins stitched together. You can see the stitch marks no, themselves. No, no, no. Where is the, the Oh, Israel. Yeah, it's in Israel. Any museums or museum or something? Yes, and I'm sure that they keep it under lock and key, though. Just like in the Lanier Library, for the small portion of Esther or whatever he's got, he has uh, something, they have <coughs> something draped over it so that sunlight doesn't hit it, if you've ever been there. Didn't they come to the Eastern Museum? Yeah. Yeah, the Dead Sea Scrolls came, some of them. But there's so many. There are so many. But you can browse this whole thing, and it is just, it's amazing to see. And this copy is uh, over a hundred years before Jesus came to earth in flesh, and all of the prophecies in Isaiah that refer to the Messiah. We have a copy which predates the Messiah coming here. So it's pretty fascinating to reflect on. Uh, go read Isaiah 53. <laughs> go read all of, all of the prophecies about the Messiah in Isaiah. And then to think, we have a copy from before Jesus was here in the flesh. All right, the Septuagint. The Septuagint is a copy of the Old Testament in Greek. It's the Greek Old Testament. It was done around 250 B.C. Uh, Josephus's Antiquities of the Jews, Book 12, Chapter 2, is the very best place to go to find out the background for how this was written. Uh, I highly recommend you read it. It was done under Ptolemy Philadelphus, uh, King Ptolemy Philadelphus, Ptolemy II. He was a Greek ruler uh, after Alexander conquered the known world. His empire was split amongst his generals. And this uh, particular branch what ruled over Egypt. So Greek is the language, the common language that they're all speaking, thanks to Alexander the Great. And you've got a lot of Jewish people, a lot of Israelites that are in exile, that aren't even living in the land, although they could be living in the land at this particular time. 
and they, they don't speak Hebrew. And so he invites the Jews over, or the Israelites, and they sent people from each tribe. They sent 70 Hebrew scholars to do a translation. And he, he wanted it for his collection of books at the Library of Alexandria that you've probably heard of. And so uh, the Septuagint is named for the 70 Hebrew scholars. The LXX are the Roman numerals for 70. So when you see, and Septuagint is 70. Okay, so that's referring to these 70 Hebrew scholars. It took them about 72 days to translate Genesis through Deuteronomy. But you got 70 of them working together. It's a really cool story. This is the most reliable story about it. There are some other stories that are, sound very fanciful, sound made up, honestly. Josephus is, is the, the, the best version, in my opinion. Okay, uh, so Greek was the common language, and this worked out very well because now Gentiles could have an easy time reading the Old Testament. And the whole Old Testament was finished, but Genesis through Deuteronomy was finished in those 72 days. In fact, the Septuagint is the Old Testament for the earliest church. And there's a lot of quotations in the New Testament letters that are from the Septuagint. Okay? So this is, it is a translation from the original language, but the Hebrew scholars themselves are the ones that did it. And so this, uh, for the longest time, represented the earliest copy of the Old Testament that we had. But here's the thing. These scholars are excellent in Hebrew and Greek. So they're, it's not like they're like, oh, I don't know a Greek word. I don't even know Greek. So they already know both languages. And these people are not like of today. And Ptolemy himself, he really set it up for them. So he set them up for success. Uh, he pulled out all the stops. They had all the materials that they needed, all the whole workspace, and they were left alone. Yeah. Starbucks. Yeah. <laughs> Starbucks, yeah. <laughs> That 72 days include the, uh, all the uh, Sabbaths? Sabbaths? Very good. I'm sure they took the Sabbaths, but I would say probably it doesn't because it's 72 working days. So probably not including the Sabbaths. <laughs> yeah. They were on the 980 schedule, actually. They were. <laughs> but when you're passionate about something like this, you're going to pour yourself into it and be like, oh, are you kidding? I get to do this? I get to, no one's going to bother me all day? Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. More matzah. <laughs> Maybe you mentioned that. So what was the reason he requested the translation? Because he, he wanted all knowledge and all books to be gathered at the library in Alexandria. And he greatly respected the Jews. He greatly respected God. And so he, yeah, because if it's in Hebrew and you want this library that the whole world can come to and be world famous and they can't read Hebrew, they're like, eh, it doesn't do us any good. So that's the Septuagint. Highly respected. I highly, highly regard the Septuagint. Especially since you read the early church fathers, this is what they're reading. This is what the disciples of the apostles are reading for the scripture. Uh, okay, so the other one that, we, uh, that is spoken of and that we have today is the Samaritan text. It's the earliest Hebrew manuscript of the Old Testament. They call it the Samaritan Hebrew. Actually, Eusebius himself refers to it as the Samaritan Hebrew uh, because this is the one that uses the paleo uh, characters, the paleo Hebrew characters instead of the Aramaic characters. Uh, he mentions it, Eusebius mentions it in his fantastic work, The Chronicon, where he does a textual analysis of the Septuagint and the Samaritan Hebrew that has the Paleo-Hebrew text, and then the Judean Hebrew, which has the Aramaic script. So he does a, a full analysis on it that only geeks like me have read. <laughs> And it's, it's, it's phenomenal. Uh, but the oldest existing copies of this are also in the Dead Sea Scrolls with the Paleo-Hebrew uh, characters. The other one is the Masoretic text, the MT, they call it. 
It is uh, the Hebrew Old Testament with Aramaic Hebrew characters, the ones that you're used to seeing today. These copies, the copies that we have of this are from around A.D. 950. So they're, they're pretty uh, late yeah. in the game. So when you're saying, we, we know for a fact that we have the Old Testament correct, we have copies from 950 about things that were written in the 1400s B.C. Ooh, from 1400 B.C. to 950 is a huge step. So uh, before the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, you had a lot of scholars going, you don't know what you've got. You people are crazy. And then so they'd say, yeah, but we have the Septuagint. And the Septuagint copies, we have some copies of Septuagint from the B.C. era, so take that. And they say, yeah, but you don't have it in Hebrew. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, the, the copies are nearly identical to the Dead Sea Scrolls and LXX from over the thousand years. So the Aramaic copies of uh, the Masoretic text from the 950s is co comparable to the Aramaic characters that we have from the Dead Sea Scrolls and from the LXX, from the uh, Septuagint, which were a thousand years earlier. So we have not a lot of difference. I will get into some of the differences here in a bit. Uh, it was put together, the, the, the Masoretes are a Jewish family who wanted to put together the um, most definitive Hebrew, Aramaic Hebrew copy of the Old Testament for themselves. They worked for hundreds of years. They were some of the most meticulous people at copying from the old copies that they had to the new copies. And they would also, any mistakes that they would make, even if it was one letter off, they would burn it. Uh, I won't go into great detail about their hard work, uh, but the, so they only had certain scriptures available from the 6th to the 10th centuries AD, and that's when they started the 6th century AD. They started, and whatever copies they had from that time, that's what they started with, but they used the Aramaic copies. Because they weren't going to use the uh, Samaritan uh, version, but the Samaritan is just a name for it. It's actually the Paleo-Hebrew script. They didn't use Paleo-Hebrew. I don't even know if they could read Paleo-Hebrew. So they used the modern one? Yeah, the modern. <laughs> so the modern really originates Back in the day, yeah, from the 500s. Uh, 400s, 500s, the Aramaic script. Uh, so this is the main base text that makes up your Old Testament. Masoretic. The Masoretic text. Okay? It, and it was not that way. Like I said, the church used the Septuagint as their Old Testament. Then the Roman Catholic Church switched to the Latin translation. And then in the Reformation period, we moved away from the Septuagint to the Masoretic text because they wanted something that was in the Hebrew, the, in the original language. So uh, for my part, I'm not that crazy about some aspects of the Masoretic text. There are differences, and they have a significant impact on chronology <laughs> and the height of Goliath. <laughs> and things, some, some things like that. There's, there are also some, some things that are in the Masoretic that you, you don't find in the Samaritan, and some word choices are different. Nothing uh, hugely significant except for chronology. Uh, but for that, I highly recommend you read Eusebius's Chronicon. He deals at length with this. Eusebius lived in the 300s AD. And he was uh, one of the elders at the church of Caesarea. Uh, the New Testament. <clears throat> the actual writing of the New Testament was somewhere around the 40s or early or 30s. But the 40s, Matthew was the first one written and it was written in Hebrew. Uh, sometime in the 40s. And then uh, the final book of the New Testament was completed around 95 AD under the reign of Domitian. Under the reign of Domitian, John wrote Revelation. The uh, evidence for that date is overwhelming. So mid to late 90s. We're talking like seven years after the resurrection? Uh, if, if you want to say that <clears throat> the resurrection was sometime between 30 and 33, 35 AD. So it'd be five. Well, I think he probably wrote it closer to 48 AD. So 10 years, yeah. 10, 15 years. Somewhere in there. I don't sweat little five-year swings at, when it's this 
uh, close to our time. Well, why did he wait? So it, why did he wait is a phenomenal question because you have the apostles are eyewitnesses. As we see in Acts 1.8, you will be my witnesses here in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and even to the ends of the earth. So the, the waiting comes with they are there and they're eyewitnesses. And it's, you're talking about everybody knows these sort of things. He wrote it before he left Jerusalem. And interestingly enough, Eusebius records about how in India, uh, in Eusebius's day, they still had a copy of Matthew in wow. Hebrew. Wow. That's amazing. So, you know, if you're interested in, in reading those sorts of things, uh, you can find out all these amazing things that nobody ever talks about. And that you'll find that in uh, Eusebius's History of the Church. Uh, the earliest fragments that we have come from a, manus uh, from a manuscript. It comes from around 125 A.D. It's this papyrus P52. It uh, contains John 18, 31 through 33 and 18, 37 through 38. It is written in Greek, all capital letters with no spaces in between them and no punctuation. So the, the good news is we have fragments of every verse of the New Testament uh, anywhere from 125 till 350 A.D. We have every verse exists to this day. And I'm going to show you some big ones coming up. One is the Codex Vaticanus. It, a codex is a book. So uh, the fact that it's in a book helps you to identify the time frame of when it is written because scrolls continued to be used throughout the Roman Empire until uh, a few hundred years AD when they made a transition to books. And these are the books like we see today, a bound book with pages. And you open up like this and can read. The Codex Vaticanus, Codex Book Vaticanus, named after the Vatican, where they found this in the Vatican Library. It is a complete book of the Old and New Testament in Greek, and it was copied sometime around 300 to 325 AD, which was during the time that Eusebius lived. So who found it, do you know? Uh, Bob. <laughs> Some guy named Bob. This one I don't know. The next one I'm going to show you I do know. Uh, but this was discovered. It is the Greek and Old, uh, the Old Testament in Greek, and the New Testament, of course, in Greek. It's complete. The Old Testament in Greek is the Septuagint, and this guy, Lancelot Brenton, did a translation of it in the 1900s into English. So if you want to read the Septuagint, you would read Lancelot Brenton's version, and it is a translation of the Old Testament that you find in the Codex Vaticanus. Um, and, and that's around 300 to 325 AD, which is extremely close to the time these things were written originally. Uh, I've got a link there. You can copy and paste that. You can browse. They took a picture of every page. You can browse everything and see everything. You can see scribes that write little notes in here. And if you can read it, then you know what the, the note was. <laughs> <clears throat> um, next one is Codex Sinaiticus which I used Codex Sinaiticus when I was teaching through Revelation. It was copied around 330 to 360 AD, so very near the same time as Codex Vaticanus. Uh, I also have this link that you can copy and paste, and you can browse this and look at every page. You can zoom in. Same thing with the Vaticanus. This one has a translation, an English translation, but be careful. The English translation they have does not match the Greek. So that yeah, so this was discovered in the monastery on Mount Sinai in the late 1800s by a man named Tichendorf. And the monks there didn't know what they had. It has the entire New Testament in Greek, uh, and both of them have the Apocrypha as well, I should, should note. Uh, I think this one actually has a few early church fathers' uh, writings, which is pretty cool, in Greek. And you say it does not line up. Yeah, but the, the English translation they have there is not word for word. They just threw one of the uh, free English translations up there so that you would know approximately where you were at. There's subtle differences. And the fascinating thing is I found in the Codex Sinaiticus 
at the bottom of one of the pages all this writing in Arabic. Some Arabic Christian had written, he was talking about wormwood, the star uh, wormwood uh, that, that causes the bitterness, and he was writing in Arabic about uh, what the Arabs know about that star. It was pretty fascinating. Um, <clears throat> the material helped you determine the date and the region. So if it's papyrus, it's likely going to have come from somewhere around the Nile region uh, of Egypt. Uh, vellum, parchment, it's going to be animal skins, which could really be anywhere. Is it a scroll or a codex? Scrolls were used earlier. Codices were used later. And the uh, type of writing, um, oh yeah, the style of writing, was it a Paleo-Hebrew or an Aramaic Hebrew? Let's you know about the time frame of that. Uh, majuscule versus minuscule Greek letters. Uppercase versus lowercase. Uh, uppercase, this is exactly how they would write. Uh, all uppercase and all uh, right next to each other. No space in between the words. This is how they read. For them it wasn't a problem. Uh, if, you, if we did it in English, it wouldn't be too much of a problem for us either. But we're not used to, to reading it that way. They were. And this is how they read it. Later on, other people uh, did a faster way to write. And so they have these minuscules, and this happened later. So if you see copies of Greek like this, you can know, oh, that must be early. If you see it more like this, then you go, okay, that's later. Uh, there's over 5,000 complete New Testament manuscripts. That's a lot. That lot. Uh, 24,000 plus portions of manuscript. Nothing else compares to this, by the way. There's no other ancient writing that has this much evidence. This is intellectual evidence. Okay. Oh, what did I miss there? Yeah, and the numbers are being added to every year by various people. Other methods of translation. The early church fathers put so much scripture in their writings and, and uh, liturgies that were written and commentaries that people did of various scriptures, diaries that were written, books and letters that were written. So many scripture uh, were, was put into these letters that we could reconstruct the entire New Testament just on these quotations alone by uh, 325 A.D. So if we, as we had said last week, if you burned every copy that we have of the Bible, we can reconstruct it with the early church father quotations. I'm thankful to them for doing that. Uh, this is even leaving out the 15,000 plus copies we have of early translations into other languages like Syriac, Latin, Sahidic, Boharic, Egyptian, Armenian, Gothic, Georgian, Ethiopic, Nubian, all sorts of copies uh, that we have. So this is well attested to, my friends. Extremely well attested to. In fact, uh, you think about in terms of the writings of Caesar, originally recorded 144 B.C., the manuscripts that we have of the writings of Caesar date from 900 A.D. These are accepted works of Caesar. It's a thousand year difference between when it was written and, and the copies that we actually have. Nobody has a problem accepting that. We're accepting any of these works as being authoritative and saying this is what it said and we're good with that. With the New Testament itself, in this particular chart, has it written somewhere between 35 and 100 A.D., the original autographs. The manuscripts we have date for the entire thing date from 100 to 150, which would be a time span, which they have here of 5 to 30, it'd be a little bit greater than that, and over 5,700 copies. Wow. Uh, the New Testament itself is the most attested to ancient writing. Most attested, scientifically speaking. If you want to say, ah, you can't trust the, the New Testament or the Old Testament, you've got to throw it out, then you've got to throw everything else out. You've got to throw out Aristotle and Plato. You've got to throw out Herodotus. You've got to throw out Josephus. You've got to throw out Homer. And say, stop, stop teaching like you know what Homer said. Nobody knows what Homer said. Uh, Homer was written around 900 B.C. The copies, the earliest manuscript we have is 400 B.C. There's 643 total copies. You can't trust Homer. You can trust 
the New Testament. You can trust the Old Testament. Because there's always, there's always a debate between non-believers and... The yes. They, they, will, they, will, they will tackle you and say, oh, but how do you trust that? I mean, so who do you... Yeah. You know, how do you know that is true? How do you know, you know that really happened? Yeah. And so I guess what you're trying to say is <laughs> chronologically and as per the copies and the... Yes. Years, if you... If that were right, then which it is throw everything else yeah. away. Yeah. Yes. Okay. If if that's not good enough, then these all are just horrible. Well, and two, look at how many five thousand seven hundred. The rest of those are not as high. Yeah, Aristophanes, a Greek playwright. He wrote uh, sometime between 450 and 385 BC. The copies, the manuscripts we have are from 900. There's a 1,200 year difference. And there's, and there's 10. 10. Yeah. And I've read some of his plays. So I say, oh, I can't trust it. And there's more than that, too. I mean, even some of Shakespeare's works are contested, or Mozart, for that matter. His Requiem, a lot of that's contested. So, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that within modern day, you're right. Like, yeah. And that's even close. I mean, right, Shakespeare's 1500s, exactly. Mozart's 1700s. When you're, saying, when you're saying copies survived, and you're, you know... Copies that we have in hand. Right, but yeah. for instance, 5,700 copies of the New Testament is same books in different places. Collected. Yes, so yes. So all that collected is about... Uh, okay. 5,700, okay, yeah. 5,700, 5, right. Yeah. Okay, uh, so we have excellent and reliable manuscripts of the original autographs, and the Bible is the best scientifically attested to ancient writing. Hands down. So if you want to have an intellectual argument with somebody... Around. Yeah. <laughs> Say, re refute that. Uh, textual criticism. Matt. So it, it's fair to say Jesus trusted the copies of the Old Testament too, right? Because he went in and said, yes. this is fulfilled in your hearing. Absolutely. Right, right. In synagogue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, refute Jesus. But that argument is not going to work against a non-believer. They're going to be, if they're going to be moved at all, which I would, I would doubt they will be moved at all, then they would be moved by this intellectual argument that uh, has been made now in your hearing. Uh, textual criticism is, uh, so all the available manuscripts that we have, if you compare them based upon their date, the geographic distribution, like these texts that we have come from this particular uh, region, textual tendencies, what texts do they have in various places, uh, the genealogy of the different texts and other such matters, you, uh, you use all this data to determine what is most likely to have been the original reading. This is what textual criticism deals with if you've ever heard this term before. And whatever you think about it, this is precisely what it seeks to do. It seeks to go, okay, we have one copy that says this from this age and one copy that says that from one age. What are the differences and which one is likely closer to the most original? Uh, this dis discipline came about because there are variants. There, it's not every copy you pick up is identical. There are variants. You have people involved in this copying process. Uh, but this transmission is not perfect because there is a human element involved. And there are going to be mistakes. Uh, the variants. A variant is a difference in the manuscript text between two or more manuscripts. Uh, so there's two types of mistakes. Unintentional mistakes and intentional additions. And so that's, that's the two types of mistakes. Unintentional errors are very simple. A mistake in letters. Somebody uh, used one letter over the other as they were copying. And that's easy to point out. Uh, if somebody's dictating to a group of scribes what the Bible says, and some words sounded similar, some one scribe might write something down incorrectly based on it sounded similar, homophony. Uh, also, somebody might repeat a word or letter. Paul Paul said to them, <laughs> <laughs> well, well, it should be Paul Paul. Um, <clears throat> a fusion combining letters or words together to, to uh, make a, a new word? Y'all. <laughs> That's good. Uh, omission of text based on similar endings of words. If there's a, a similar ending of a word, somebody might stop when they really should have gone about three more words on that particular verse. Uh, changing a letter or word order uh, happens. Uh, changing the order of, of the letters. In fact, here's uh, one thing that fascinates me is Alexander the Great. 
is called Iskandar Akbar, Iskandar the Great by the uh, Arabs. Alexander Iskandar, they flip the k to a sk. Um, that sort of thing happens. People will change that uh, in their words. Scribal margin notes. A scribe may have written a margin note, and it might, in, in an earlier uh, manuscript, that might find its way into the text <laughs> in a later manuscript. Accident. <laughs> it's like the copy they had had scribes' margin notes that found its way into scripture. Uh, intentional errors. Oh, I meant to not have it like that. I want them all out there at once. Okay. Uh, pronoun substitution. This is the number one variant that you're going to find. Some scribe is going along writing, uh, God said that he would do this and he would do that and he was going to do this and he, you know, he says, I'm going to put God here instead of he because I don't want the reader to forget we're still talking about God because they might get confused about the pronoun. So substituting God for he or he for God or he for the Lord or adding the Lord somewhere or taking it away and putting he, that happens. Uh, that's an intentional error. They shouldn't have done it. Updating, oh, it's a big one. Updating less known geographical names with the most recent names. The Hebrews, scribes, and the, the uh, Christian scribes are both bad for this. Updating the, the name of a place that nobody knows anymore. Like, uh, what was Cyprus called before <laughs> the Europeans came here? Anybody know? <laughs> if I started telling you... On the map. It was called or uh, Sumer or Shinar. Do the Greeks have a sh sound in their language? Sh no. <laughs> That's why Shinar in the Hebrew turns into Sumer in the Greek. Um, but that happens. Um, changes in grammar, spelling, modernization of language. That's an intentional error. Harmonization of passages with the gospel. Say, well, I might as well make it sound more like what we see in Mark or Matthew. Since it's talking about the same story, we'll use the same Greek words. Uh, theological additions. Oh, this one's going to hurt. 1 John 5, 7, uh, where it talks about the Trinity. Uh, Erasmus of Rotterdam in the 16th century. He did not include that because he couldn't find any Greek version that had that, any at all. And so... Which, which translation would be missing John Well, it's expanded in the King James, but the Roman Catholic Church wanted to make sure that it was in there, and so they found a Greek translation with it, and in his later editions he added uh, so that the, it would clarify that it's talking about the Trinity. The Trinity is in the Bible. I'm not worried about that. Somebody adding something because the church said do it into the Bible, that's no good. Uh, liturgical editions, like for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Oh, you see this a lot in the early church. This is something they say a lot when they're ending something with uh, a prayer. So when the Lord's Prayer ends, an addition for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen is an easy addition that you don't find in the earliest copies. So that's, but that's a, litur a liturgical statement that would be said often. Right. And so it was just natural for it to be there. So in the Lord's Prayer, when we're praying, we end it this way, the Bible should, we should end it this way. And you shouldn't have put that in there if it's not supposed to be in there. Uh, but notice it completely changes every belief that you ever had. Yes or no? No. <laughs> no, no. Right. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's nothing major. Uh, there's no major difference. Uh, but the guidelines for textual criticism are as follows. The shorter reading is preferred. In other texts we, that you can study, it is typical that a later copy will have other things added to it as compared to earlier copies. This is especially apparent in all of the writings of Ignatius of Smyrna, who wrote letters towards the end of the first century. There are short versions and long versions of his writings. The harder reading is preferred because a scribe is more likely to try to change the language to make it a little clear. The earlier reading is preferred. Uh, the wider geographic distribution is preferred. 
and the number of manuscripts may add weight, but quality overrules quantity every time. Uh, so it's, it's not always the case that the majority uh, texts that use this particular translation are correct. If you only see them appearing in the 13th century and you don't see any prior to that, then you could probably deduce that it's been added. Something has been added. Uh, but it's, it's minimal. It's very minimal. The, the thing that drives me nuts is the, the issues of chronology. The Septuagint says that Israel was in Canaan and Egypt for 430 years, which that fits with the chronology that is given to us. If you go and add up all the uh, so-and-so was born and had a son at this age, when you do that math, it ties to 430 total years of Israel being in Canaan and Egypt. The Masoretic text says that it's 430 years total in Egypt alone which has caused a lot of chronological issues. Uh, and it conflicts with what Paul says in Galatians 3, 16 through 17, where he says from the time that the promise was made to Abraham until the giving of the law to Moses was 430 years. So it's, it's a chronological issue like that. For me, my number one hot button issue with these variants is the chronology. Because the chronology, we need to have our chronology right so that we can debate those who doubt the chronology of the Bible. Uh, over 300,000 manuscript variants have been found in the new, uh, all the available manuscript, of all the mail, available New Testament manuscripts, but 99% of them make no difference at all. And the less than 1% are things like forcefully putting the Trinity somewhere where it is already implied, but clarifying it to make sure that you understand we're talking about the Trinity here. And nothing affects actual or correct doctrine. All of them have been identified. We're not hiding jack squat. Uh, if you want to see something, check your margins. Uh, John 8, the story of the woman caught in sin. In the earliest manuscripts, that story is not in John 8. It was later placed in John 8 because it was recognized that this was a legitimate story. We just don't know where it goes. If you want to find out other stories about Jesus that are legitimate, or stories about John, the Apostle John, I highly recommend you read Eusebius's History of the Church. Okay. Um, Wasn't it John that said, if it were all written, all the books couldn't contain it? Exactly. That's right. Thank you. Yeah, very good. Uh, so my, my advice to you is to challenge the challengers. When they say the Bible's been corrupted, it's been changed, you ask them, who changed it? Where was it changed? When was it changed? What was changed? Why was it changed? How was it changed? They're not going to be able to answer any of this. They're more interested in what their professor told them. Oh, you can't trust the Bible. The Bible's been changed. So it was translated in Latin and English and uh, uh, Fran France, Franco, you know. They don't know what they're talking about. People don't... People have a, everybody has an opinion about this, and most of them haven't studied anything. It's just a professor or somebody, a friend of mine told me, oh, cool, a friend of mine from college told me that you should eat, eat all the fatty foods you want, and it'll be healthy for you. Yeah. Uh, so we're not hiding anything, and we're not trying to hide anything. There's nothing to hide. Everything is laid bare. And I say, if you want to treat the Bible a certain way, you've got to treat everything that way. And you cannot throw the Bible out. Challenge the challengers. When somebody, I don't care who it is. Is that John Cleese? That is John Cleese. <laughs> this is uh, John Cleese from Monty Python skit. I love it. The Argument Clinic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Terry Jones just died. That's right. So, uh, but when, when somebody says that, you put it back on them. I mean, the evidence is there. 